Good evening. My name is Michael Williams. I'm director of the Wheeler Centre, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here for this evening's event. We uh, are hearing from a very distinguished speaker indeed, being interviewed by one of the country's foremost interviewers. Let's talk about architecture. Uh, and to introduce our guest tonight and uh, to have a conversation with him after he's finished speaking, please welcome uh, star of ABC News Breakfast and uh, celebrated journalist uh, Virginia Trioli. Please make a very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here tonight. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much uh, for coming out for our, what I know will be a really wonderful conversation. I'm here to introduce you to David Giannotten, who's the partner in charge of OMA's Hong Kong office. He launched the Dutch firm's Asian headquarters in 2009, where he supervises major projects such as the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, the Taipei Performing Arts Centre, which he'll be speaking to you about tonight. He joined OMA in 2008, launched OMA's Hong Kong office in 2009, and became partner in 2010. And he leads OMA's large portfolio in the Asia Pacific region, and he's one of three managing directors of the worldwide OMA holding. I'm not gonna run through all the projects that he's been involved in and he's working on at the moment, because I know a great deal of that he's going to run through for you today. But he's speaking to us today, of course, about his projects and the projects of the firm, but also about the importance of place, local culture, and local identity in architecture, which to some extent is a rather heretical notion, particularly in the era of the, the rock star architect, as we have, uh, the iconic building that is often lobbed on us totally free of local context. So what is the role of place for new building when you're making a new place? Uh, he and I also agree that um, in Darling Harbour, which is a connection that his firm has at the moment, which he will tell you about, I'm sure, which is really fascinating, that in that beautiful city of Sydney, um, the uh, achievement of architecture at Darling Harbour is a signal achievement in that it's managed to make one of the most geographically blessed and beautiful places, one of the most bloody ugly you'll ever see. And, um, and that's where OMA will come into their own, we hope. So please make very welcome this evening, David Giannotten. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all coming out. Naomi, thank you for the invitation to talk. Uh, first of all, I'm not going to talk about Darling Harbour, so anybody that's in the room that expects that, I will not show it. Um, <laughs> because uh, that's uh, under development still. I will talk about several things uh, during my talk uh, related to planning, related to building, related to temporary interventions, which M Pavilion is a very good example of, and also about creation of research and design. Um, first, a very quick introduction of our firm for who doesn't know. OMA uh, started in 1974 by Rem Kolhas. We are currently a partnership of 10 partners since four weeks ago, uh, and I'm leading the OMA Asia office uh, together with Michael Kokora. Uh, we strongly believe that we need to be there where our clients are, where our contacts are, where we work in. So we don't work in an ivory tower somewhere in Rotterdam. Uh, we really want to be there where our projects are. That's why I moved my whole family to Hong Kong and travel constantly to where we work. Uh, we together as partnership come together every two weeks, some, every two months uh, somewhere in the world to discuss uh, rather than having our clients travel to us. OMA is an architectural office. Uh, we do a lot of buildings, uh, some of them are very well known, uh, but we also have our own think tank, uh, AMO, which is a mirror image of our name, nothing more, uh, also nothing less. And what we do uh, with that is kind of try to expand the realm of an art typ typical architectural firm. With OMA, we are real, we do, we act, we build, we change, we manifest, and we, we are reactive. And with AMO, we are virtual, we think, we reflect. It's not per se building, we observe, and we make manifestos and very proactively. Currently, our agenda is focused on architecture, on the metropolis, urban design, on energy, on memory, a very specific topic in Asia and also in Australia, and on Aura, where we do a lot of work uh, with many brands around the world. Uh, we do specific research in Asia on the countryside and on the community, very 
important in especially the developing countries in Asia and the rapid urbanization there. Uh, our portfolio in this part of the world since 2009 expanded from three projects to 34 uh, to date. Uh, Darling Harbour is already mentioned in um, Sydney and uh, we are looking uh, at Australia with a great uh, expectation and uh, also great ideas in our pockets already uh, through our research. Most of you might know us from CCTV, uh, of course a world famous building, I will not talk about that. And in the cultural realm, uh, the Casa de Musica in Porto, the first concert house with a window to the city so that you can play with the city as your backdrop. Uh, or the Seattle Public Library that changed the city landscape uh, from a city that was kind of not attractive at all to a city where visitors uh, streamed in to the city in large numbers. Today I want to talk about how uh, can architecture influence the cultural identity of cities. Uh, of course, by careful planning of cultural interventions. I say of course, but if you look at governments, it's not always of course. The innovation of cultural typologies, uh, something that is difficult uh, because everybody working in the cultural realm has its precedence and how to push the boundaries of these precedents. And then temporary interventions very important for the debate and for pushing the debate forward and then by the creation of that debate and trying to set the agenda forward and not uh, only talk about the current or the past. First, careful planning of cultural intervention. I will show you our project for a new dimension we did in 2009 for Hong Kong. Um, it's a project that in the end didn't go forward and I will also explain later. Um, but it is an, an interesting project because that was for the first time where we were asked to create a new cultural hub in the city from scratch. There was not even a, a program or there was an idea of a program, but it actually didn't make any sense. So this is uh, uh, the West Coulomb Cultural District site right in the middle of the city uh, on the Victoria Harbour, uh, kind of with the ICC building, the highest building of the city in its backdrop a piece of land that is enormously valuable and the city uh, took the courageous decision to make this a cultural district. And this was the project they gave us or the brief they gave us, uh, kind of housing, hotel or retail to support the whole facility. Uh, the third largest museum in the world, by the way, they didn't have any collection. Uh, so that was a kind of question. And then uh, four small theaters, four medium theaters, four large theaters and a very extra large theater and all kinds of exhibition facilities around it. Currently, Hong Kong has three theaters and they're never full. So it's a kind of an interesting quest how a city comes with a plan that more or less make their program five times as big uh, and they don't really think about what to do there. They just want to have it on a level of prestige. Many of you know Hong Kong like this, and obviously this is the vibrancy uh, that is indeed there, uh, and I live in uh, at the moment um, already six years. It's very intense, but also extremely beautiful and very vibrant culturally, especially on the streets. However, uh, this is also Hong Kong. Uh, green is everywhere, uh, and it is in a reach with the MTR in 20 minutes, and you're out there a site many people don't know when they visit the city for just two days. And in that green, uh, there are man many of the significant cultural contexts uh, of the city, uh, the villages where the city grew from, and that actually still have all the grassroots culture, like the opera, uh, in them, very often in temporary venues made out of bamboo. So instead of making a shiny, vibrant uh, cultural precinct, we thought it would be interesting to do something else right in the city center and to create a kind of a utopia. So 726,000 square meters on that site. Uh, we said, let's make the site green uh, as outside of the city and then put simply three small villages on top of them that have the cultural uh, culture in them. And with that, uh, we presented a plan that has a very different density and I will explain that later than our competitors. Uh, we really wanted to create a Hong Kong utopia and back to some of the culture that people uh, miss and know so well. 
One of our main arguments was that art is not passive consumption. Kind of, if you looked at that program, it was kind of catered for people that were coming in by train from China, for all the musicals that come from around the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, they buy a ticket, go into one of these theaters, and leave again. But that's not a real uh, cultural interaction. Uh, we really wanted to say art is work. And how do you nurture our cultural life in a city? Is by also creating a base that understands this, but that actually works in the art. And why do I say that? If you look at Hong Kong at the current state, only 0.6% of the uh, people that are working in Hong Kong are employed in anything related to art or design. So that's unbelievably limited. And they wanted to inject a program larger than the West End in London, where in London 3.3% uh, is employed in that art. So we said, that, please don't do it. Obviously, we couldn't say scrap half or maybe even just build one, uh, because then we would probably not be considered anymore. So we started uh, very uh, modestly and we said take four theaters out and build schools and production areas for artists and schools for managers to start managing a cultural facility like this. So uh, we said do the whole site as a park, uh, the park of the new horizon. And why was it called the new horizon? Because this is the current situation of parks of Hong Kong. <laughs> Uh, you can do an unbelievable amount of things, um, not. Uh, so the, the only thing you can do is throw your thresh away. There's not a, a cross there. <laughs> um, so we said maybe this is a better idea. Uh, from now on, everybody can do everything uh, in this park of the New Horizon. And then grassroots uh, going to start interacting with the precinct and, and actually make their hands dirty instead of keep everything clean, uh, which is very much needed in, in cultural life. So we designed a park where everything was possible, um, which is uh, obviously was a challenge again for the Hong Kong government. Uh, but in the end, they found a way to kind of get to grips with it and at least consider it. And then we said, art in the east, that's the first village. It's a three-dimensional village, and that has that museum. And we said that museum, you should reduce it to one third and build production facilities, build an auction house, build uh, art factories for people to live and to really create the art there uh, that is ex exhibited in the M plus because maybe Uli Zeek will give you one third of his collection but then still you have uh, about 10,000 square meters uh, left. So please uh, make sure you also start generating art and not only import it. Uh, so this was our perception of the M plus museum. Again, quite uh, far-fetched for the government, uh, but uh, I think it's very important that Hong Kong also produces uh, what they're gonna show. And then you know, we choose also the graphics to be very uh, done by Hong Kong uh, artists uh, that do comic books to be very clear uh, to the people uh, of the context. We had to sell this plan. We had to find buy-in of the, of the people of the city and more or less compete against them. And then this was uh, theater in the West where we combined just four theaters as a start phase and combined them in such a way that the production areas are in between, that the theaters can be combined, but also can be used separately um, with all the production facilities open to the public so that people could see uh, what is needed. And then the Grand Theater, you could almost walk into it uh, without having any barriers. Also a street theater, uh, street art is very important in Hong Kong and we really wanted to bring that into a formal realm. And then the chamber music hall at the end with a great view uh, to the harbor and to the island, to the city. The middle village is really a tiny village. We had to compete to the highest building uh, with a little bit of program. So we said, let's make it a miniature Hong Kong. Uh, we put the Shichu uh, theater, which is the opera house and the premier film theater, two cultural elements of Hong Kong that are very vibrant and important on the edges, and then put a market street in between, a night market, a very vibrant place. So the situ, the night market, uh, how repetitive, doesn't matter. Uh, people will come anyway. And then uh, the premier film theater, uh, which is very needed in a city of film, uh, where there is not even a cinema that is exposed to the public realm. 
For this, we also had to do all kinds of financial assessment, which is important to say. Cultural planning these days is also financial planning. And as an architect or a planner or a cultural uh, uh, manager being interested in how to create new models for cities to work with. And here we worked with McKinsey to kind of create an operation surplus that could be injected back into the museum and into the theaters to create program. Because creating program in the end uh, brings the visitors and is important. So uh, we had to, I had to do 148 presentations in half a year to sell this to the public. Uh, very often not such a big crowd, sometimes nine people. Uh, sometimes nine people that even didn't speak English. Uh, so how, how do I sell my plan? Uh, but in the end, we were very successful. We won the jury bid for this project. We also won the public vote for the bid. And then obviously the government had to decide, do we dare to go with a party that says uh, you should do it differently or should we stick with the plan and make a glamorous uh, cultural uh, vicinity uh, that uh, attracts a lot of people? And in the end, and it was very naive from us to consider that we even had a chance. They went for Foster's plan because they branded it as the first zero carbon cultural district in the world and more than 5,000 trees. Of course, very important and popular statements uh, that probably bring a lot of culture to the city. Um, we, things that we learned uh, during that process, and we are now using in many urban planning exercises that we have around Asia, because it was noticed, maybe not by the Hong Kong government, but by many other governments. This is an example in Taiyuan, uh, in China, where we are asked to kind of create a full new part of the city, right in the heart of the city, with a lot of cultural facilities, but also a lot of heritage uh, facilities, uh, remembering uh, China's industrial past, which is a very interesting part, because that is now erased. Everything goes to Vietnam, Myanmar. Uh, it's not so much produced anymore. And these areas uh, that are only 30 to 50 years old uh, already are on the list of preservation and have a very cultural, vibrant uh, position. These are the, the places we have to work with in that master plan. Um, I will not show it more today, but there's some in the paper that was launched uh, this evening as well. So then innovation by cultural typologies, uh, also an important thing, many uh, theaters or many museum that you get are briefs that are related to functional uh, precincts or functional buildings uh, that are out there already for 20 years and people say, it works so well, can you please copy this? But no situation is the same. And I want to illustrate that by our Taipei Performing Arts Center uh, proposal. Um, a competition, an open competition, uh, which OMA normally never participates in, uh, simply because the chances are slim, but also you are never able to really express yourself um, to the maximum. But this was for us such a weird situation that we had to participate uh, and say something about it. The Xiling Night Market, the most vibrant place of Taipei, a beautiful site, and they uh, decided in all their knowledge to take that away and put three theaters, so erase all the low culture and put the high culture on that site and erase all the vibrancy for the city. We really thought that was really a strange move. A lot of international architects uh, participated. This is the night market, very vibrant, a lot of nice food uh, and a lot of stalls. Uh, so we said this needs to stay, no matter what kind of solution of building we're gonna do, this needs to be there. So the only solution that we had was to build on top of it uh, hovering above and to merge uh, low culture and high culture. Out of 154 entries, we were the only architects that dared to say, don't take it away, keep it. And pro probably that's why we, we won the competition in the end. Not with a beautiful building, but with a building that pushes the boundaries of theater making. Um, we were inspired by this dish that we saw. Uh, it's an unbelievable, interesting diagram of cooking. Uh, three things at the same time. Uh, are they the same dish? Are they separate dishes? How does it work? And uh, we had to build three theaters, and we thought this was a very inspiring thing. Maybe we can create one thing that functions on its own, that pushes the boundaries of theater, and at the same time can provide the things they ask for in the brief. 
So what we did is we wanted to minimize the footprint. Uh, we created three theaters and pulled the backs together, plugged them into one cube, and cantilevered the theaters out of the cube so that we could minimize the footprint and have all the back of houses combined. Um, and because of that, we only had to build one foyer, only one cafe, only one batch of uh, dressing rooms, only one green room for all uh, three theaters and could minimize the impact of the building on site. So this was the render that we presented. Uh, we called it a machine for theater making. Uh, again, uh, it was not designed to be extremely beautiful, but it was ex uh, really designed to function well. And this was August 27, uh, when we topped out the building. Uh, for me and for Ram, a dream came through. Uh, they really uh, built it, and they are going to kind of make this happen uh, with us, which is an exciting uh, thing in itself because it pushes all the boundaries. And why? Firstly, uh, on the ground level, there's nothing. There's still the night market. People will sit there on plastic chairs. Uh, people will interact uh, with the surroundings. Uh, the vendors will be allowed to be there. And then uh, the people that go to the theater uh, take a stair up or an escalator when you uh, need. And then you end up, this is that stair, it's already there, and you see the full open ground. And then you end up in the lobby. And only from there, your high uh, culture experience starts. It's still a very rough environment. From there, you move into the different theaters, uh, all by stairs and escalators. Uh, this is the Grand Theater, a 1,600-seat theater. Um, you take stairs and escalators up and then you end up in a folded plane. We folded the plane to keep the theater very small and intimate and have the people sit still in one room because with balconies it always feels so segregated uh, and we wanted to avoid that. And this is then a kind of an interior of that, uh, of that theater. Here you see a picture uh, of 27th of August again where you see that the plane is actually quite small. It feels quite small uh, for 1,600 people. Then the multiform theater, 800 people, experimental theater, flat floor, you can move everything you want, you can center stage, etc. Between the shells of the theater and the, uh, the facade, we take all the, the movement of the people in uh, as almost a theater play itself. And then uh, everything in that multiform theater can happen with a cafe on the roof uh, so that people can also use the roof to look at the city. Um, experimental theater from Stan Lai is world famous. Uh, it's a Taipei uh, performer. And here you see kind of a first image of that, how it is today. And then the trick. Because we put all the back of houses together, uh, these theaters can simply be combined. If you lift the backstage doors out of place, you can make a theater that is 100 meter long uh, in stage, 40 meter wide in stage, and has kind of on one side 1,600 people and on another side 800 people looking at it. If you then also put people on the side stages, you can pe put three and a half thousand people looking at one stage. A lot of theaters these days is not anymore in the theater. They're in an old factory or they're in an infrastructural building because they require an environment that has more space, that has more freedom for the creators of theater. That can still happen here. And uh, we developed this together with theater makers all over the place. So this could happen simply in the future. A large theater set where everything uh, can happen. Um, and that on top of that night market, can you uh, see that kind of vitality together? Then the Proscenium Playhouse, which is a dance theater. It's a bowl. Um, people call this building now stinky tofu with a thousand year egg. So this is the <laughs> thousand year egg, uh, and it's a round uh, theater. Uh, you move up with escalators, uh, you come under the real theater, and you move in between these shells uh, to your seat. And uh, this is the situation today, uh, very compact again. Uh, this is how it will be. This is the foyer under the theater where you arrive with the escalator, and then you move in between the facade and the theater itself to your seat. Um, around proscenium also, very first time, uh, which gives the dancers especially the feeling of freedom, large opening, and also the round ball will make it very compact but also very intimate because everybody will be very close. And this is the theater 
today. Um, here will be 800 people as well, uh, which is a big group uh, looking at the dance performances. Um, when you put low and high culture together, you also need to provide a means for people that cannot buy that ticket to still experience the building. So there's a public loop through it where you can experience everything of theater making. You don't need a ticket. You can just go through. You go into a special escalator. You go through the backstages. So you see the green rooms, the dressing rooms. You see the people that make the artists. You can even look into the stages and the stage grids, the technical grids, so that you can understand what is needed. And then you arrive at the viewing deck on the 11th floor overlooking the city. And you can even move through the Placemium Playhouse at the top, behind glass, look at the performance. You will not hear anything, but you will see it. Of course, that's necessary because else people can disturb the performance, but they can still see it and then move down uh, with an elevator back to the night market. This is these two joyful people that were so happy uh, that this is happening, uh, me and Ram on the 27th. It was the hottest day in Taipei in seven years. So that uh, was a very exciting moment for us. They even created OMA helmets for us. And here you see already at night, the night market is still very close. And the moment the hoarding is back, all these vendors uh, will be underneath this theater again. And low and high culture will still exist on one side. So innovation of typology by combining possibilities in theater, but also by combining elements of the city that are contextually so important for the vibrancy. Then temporary inventions, uh, interventions. Of course, the M Pavilion is something uh, that I'm very jealous of living in Hong Kong because that is not possible in a city like that. And you should really use it to the maximum because these spaces are so uh, experimental and can bring such a new debate to a city uh, that is uh, uh, very needed. Um, Serpentine Gallery is, of course, mentioned very often. Rem Kohlhaas did the Serpentine Gallery in 2006. Again, not a design to stand out architecturally, but to really create a marker uh, that would lit up and that would become a beacon of debate. So what OMA more or less did was not design the space on its own, but really design the program. Uh, so that was a very important choice of our company, not company to not only build the building, but to design the debate, design the constant dialogue and program, which was uh, very uh, vibrant and well visited. You also see other architects also participated heavily uh, in that. Uh, the seven screen pavilions uh, we did for Kanye West in, in Cannes in 2012, uh, where he showed his first movie, directed movie. I, I'm not sure if I should present this actually after the last two days of Kanye West in this country, but uh, at least uh, it was a very interesting commission because it was a pavilion that was open to the air, like the M Pavilion. It was constantly part of the city's uh, climate and environment, and people could move in and sit surrounded by seven screens and program these screens themselves so they could play the movie uh, reverse or forward or start somewhere and it was a very interactive uh, situation which was really nice so here you see an image of how it worked and then of course the Prama transformer of which I'm extremely proud because this was my first project going to OMA it was a temporary pavilion for for Prada uh, that needed to travel the world this is in Seoul in 2009 it uh, is a um, a space that can move uh, its position. So it's a fashion exhibition, it's an art exhibition, it's a cinema and it's a special event space. And all of them have different uh, floor plans, a circle, a square, a hexagon and a cross. And how does it work? Every two weeks uh, a crane comes and just lifts the whole building up and puts it on another site. Uh, and after it has been somewhere, it's put in the six containers that is behind it. That is the lobby, the reception, the bar. And these six containers go on to ship to the next city. And uh, it really works extremely well. So this is the waist down show Prada, Musha Prada, designed for her fashion. Uh, this is the art exhibition two weeks later uh, by, in this case, a young Korean artist that she invited to take the space over. This is movie, uh, old Italian movie for the first time translated in Korean. 
uh, which was a, a very interesting situation. And then this is special events. Uh, in this case, it was a kind of a weirdo fashion show uh, designed by, by young fashion designer. It was very interesting because it was only latex, which you normally don't see so much in Asia. So it was a kind of very interesting uh, uh, environment. If you give a space to people and just tell them you can take it for two weeks, do whatever you want, uh, they used the space completely different than I could have ever designed. But because we didn't really design anything rather than the movement, it was quite uh, easy to accommodate. And here you see an image. Uh, we made the skin out of fabric, very uh, fashionable. And uh, because of light uh, behind it, uh, you could see simply also from the outside what was happening inside. So the people in the city could also simply see it while the artists didn't even notice that they were seen not only by the public inside, but also by the public outside. Then creation of debate. Uh, I think I'm still good in time. So the Venice Biennale, um, something of this uh, summer, uh, Arsenale, Giardini for everybody that knows Venice well. So Fundamentals uh, is it called. It has a central pavilion designed by OMA, elements of architecture. It has all the national pavilions for the first time under one theme, absorbing modernity, 1914 to 2014, and Mondatalia in the Arsenale. Uh, first, the national pavilions. We really wanted to show uh, an age, uh, a, a whole century, uh, kind of with uh, the same load uh, and for several reasons. The, uh, in 2012, the themes were all over the place. Every pavilion had its own theme. And for the visitor, it was very difficult to understand what was happening because they had to go through 66 pavilions all differently. So we set one theme that is very important for all. So 1914, all the countries that are participating at that time were looking at this. So very characteristic, you would immediately recognize where is what, and 2013, uh, this is the case. Same countries, uh, buildings in the same countries, totally could be interchangeable where they are. So how did that happen in 100 years time? Also, if you look at kind of architects abroad until the 1980s, it was very rare for an architecture to work outside its own country. Some like Tange and Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier were working somewhere else, but the majority of architects kind of didn't travel uh, for an assignment. They only traveled for inspiration. Uh, that completely changed. Yeah, uh, since 1980, we're more in a plane than anywhere else, and we're constantly working uh, wherever where we can, uh, including OMA. So you need to have a total different knowledge, or it becomes generic. That is a very interesting statement. So if you don't know the context, you will, of course, design something out of your own context in a context you don't know. So it's also the age where everything disastrous or significant happened uh, in a very rapid speed. So if you compare it to all the centuries before, the last century had a huge impact on the world in almost every single country we're talking about. And we asked them to respond to that theme. So the Netherlands, looking for its own identity, but still want to build high rise, or our own building, which is a very generic building, or China, kind of a new center of arts, looking very old China, but at the same time making World Trade Centers. How does this work and how does it get together? All the pavilions gave their own interpretation. Korea in the end won, uh, because there's also the golden lion attached to it, because South Korea made a modern exhibition and North Korea made a propaganda exhibition of architecture. Very nice. All their buildings were drawn by a comic artist and, and portrayed in a very nice thing. First time they ever did the two countries an exhibition together. Japanese pavilion, they took a specific era and you could print all the drawings you wanted of that era. So you could print Tango drawings and isosaki sans drawings uh, kind of live on the site. And then the Australian pavilion, who had a very clear distinction between unbuilt and built work over the last century. So showing that a lot of architecture was built, but a lot of great works in Australia were actually not built in the last century. And they showed them and paid respect to them. And then the Chilean pavilion, who only took concrete, for example, as a starting point, because in the last century, concrete was, of course, the building material and they showed only buildings made out of concrete. 
which is now rapidly changing again uh, into uh, more different materials. And the Indonesians, for the very first time present, they simply took a total different point of view and they talked about kind of their context of building. So they didn't take the buildings itself, but their context they operate in, which was very nice and they won kind of the newcomer award. Then the central pavilion elements of architecture, we said kind of every architect works with the same elements, but we don't really know anymore where they come from, what their stories are, how to combine them uh, because of the pressure that we're constantly on this. So let's do research on them. You see the big brick in front, uh, that's the research, uh, 13 little booklets of each element. Uh, each had a room, and there's also a film where we make clips of 15 seconds of movies where one element is made. So here, this is a floor, of course. In the film itself, you, you don't, the floor is not so important, but if you just clip that part and put them all uh, after each other, it becomes very interesting what architecture does. So in history, this was a ceiling. Uh, currently, this is a ceiling. Uh, and in this building, we had a unique opportunity to combine both uh, because uh, there is that ceiling that is so beautiful in it and we uh, hide it with kind of a uh, ceiling that we see uh, today everywhere. Uh, how is that contrast? How do you work with that contrast? How you constantly inform stairs? We became lazy people uh, kind of in 1970, the first graph, that was how steep a stair was. Currently, uh, we're far from it, yeah? So maybe we should go back uh, and, and all become fit again. Um, but we also found a German guy that since the 1920s collected stairs from all over the world. So when there was a building demolished, he went in, took the stair, all its elements, documented it and put it in his archive. And he was never recognized for it. Uh, we, we came to him, he started crying. Uh, <laughs> that he was finally acknowledged, and we took his whole archive into the exhibition. Fascinating, the stair of Hitler's uh, living room uh, to his bedroom was there. The stair of Queen Victoria in one of the renovated palaces, the old, was taken out by him, and he has it. He all has it still. The guy is now 86. He's probably not gonna live very long anymore. Uh, so he gave us this now, because he thought it was so important that it would be continued and we will continue it and here you see we built many of these stairs in the exhibition as well an enormous amount of data and information so important normally architect just looks at Neufert well, how do I make my stair but can, you can do it in many different ways this is a project I did from China, or our office did. Um, there's a very important Chinese text uh, about roof building from kind of somewhere 800s, but uh, the translation got lost. Also, the Chinese characters are so traditional that many Chinese don't, uh, cannot read it anymore. So we worked with universities to make a new translation and to bring back the art of making these old roofs without any nail, any glue, anything. And we started really building them. This is our material, blue foam, of course, uh, you, you know. So we, we started translating it and make these roofs again out of blue foam. So we brought back an art of roof making and compared it with the current roofs and see how economically it could be done. Uh, craftsmanship is, of course, very much ne needed. And this project is now carried through by universities in Hong Kong and China to really create back the craftsmanship, to restore also these old roofs with their traditional craftsmanship and not build them in concrete, uh, which happens now all over the place. Balconies, this balcony is an Indian word. Uh, this, uh, these are the original balconies in India. Uh, currently, this is a balcony. Uh, kind of, I, I would say this has more character, I'm not sure, but uh, here you don't know what happens. You can put a chair and a plan to make your character, but it is totally unclear and very undefined. So we looked at balconies. Actually, balconies are very important in world history. A lot of the important things that are decided or are announced to the people is on a balcony. Yeah? Kind of all the big things happen on balconies. So we brought back uh, these balconies and built them miniature-wise uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the pavilion. Also, the Pope is up there. I cut him off. but. Uh, the, all the important balconies over the last century are portrayed, which is an interesting knowledge. Then the Mondatalia, it's a big, long space. 
Italy is its background. Uh, this is a, um, a fifth century map of Italy, uh, which we took and we said we make a cross section of Italy and we combine architecture with dance, uh, with cinema, with music, uh, and also uh, with um, a theater. And by doing so, uh, we show all the type of arts uh, together. Uh, to be able to do that, we had to convince the Biennale to run the Biennale for six months this year instead of for three years, uh, uh, three months, so that we could really combine the programs of the different Biennales on one stage. So this is an architectural exhibition with stages injected for dance, theater, cinema, music, where the arts can be combined. Here you see our model that we built, and this is the reality. Uh, so this is the uh, Italian map. And in it, uh, you find architectural exhibitions about Italy, uh, but you also find people doing dance shows whenever you're there. So you don't need to buy a ticket. It happens, they practice or they perform. Uh, music, people simply sitting to play music. And also uh, kind of even a discotheque that is there that in the evening uh, you can go to with only 60s music. So uh, for, <laughs> for me, it was a bit difficult to get into. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, 3D sand printers where you can print your own um, uh, buildings, uh, but they would dissolve uh, also immediately. So that's what I wanted to show you tonight. Thank you. I know you're going to have um, a lot of questions about that and we have time for questions. So um, start thinking about them and uh, whack your hand up. I'll identify you and we'll incorporate you into our conversation, I think, really early on because that was um, a wonderful tour of some really fantastic and energising work. They were beautiful and exciting and, and funny and, um, and, and warm to see, which was just great. So can I just first of all um, ask you, uh, though, David, because uh, I know almost everyone in this room will revere uh, Rem as a, as a hero um, for them. Can I ask uh, about him? He's not a young man now. How, how engaged is he in the daily practice? We saw him there in that, the photograph um, in Taipei. Um, Rem is, is very involved, uh, not, not only in kind of some of the projects we're doing, but also kind of in, in the dialogue with us, because our practice is really a practice of dialogue. We all have our own interests, we all have our own space in which we work, in which we operate, in which we constantly study and research. And kind of the, the main energy behind that is through the dialogue between the partners and, and also the dialogue with our staff. In that, of course, Ram is very important because he set that agenda mm -hmm. um, already for many uh, decades. But what is also very interesting about Rem is that he also picks very carefully what he is involved in and also where he leaves us our space. Because you can imagine that this type of work can only come together when many people collaborate and yes. when they are also extremely critical. This is not the work uh, that can be done by one person or by three or by six. This is an army thinking ahead, uh, trying to set an agenda at all times. And he is unbelievably uh, courageous, but also very, um, now I would almost say, friendly to give us that space to do it and not to try to control it, which is very difficult. Um, Rem was not my idol before I came to OMA. Uh, I, w I had my own practice. I, I worked with him on two uh, uh, competitions, and only the dialogue was what triggered me uh, to go to OMA and, and to come to the practice. Uh, so he also has a lot of people that don't consider him as an idol, but still mm -hmm. recognize what the guy is capable of doing. Uh, I speak to him every day about three times, uh, but that's also because I worked very closely with him before I came to Asia. Um, he's very involved, and he will probably, as uh, Niemeyer, die uh, while uh, drawing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> It's, it's super inspiring to work with somebody like that. Um, th there seems to be still such a sense of, um, of playfulness, of fun about the man as well, as we could clearly see with the, um, the Biennale project. Fun is a word that comes up in the, the research that I've done uh, on you yourself. That's, that's a very important element hmm. in, in, in the work that you do, that there must yeah. be a sense of play. Yeah, I, I think without fun, uh, no creation will uh, take its, its stage because you need to really uh, expose why uh, you came up with something and what you think 
is good about it, but also what might trigger people about it. Mm -hmm. I always say if I don't have fun with one person a day and I don't offend one person a day, <laughs> that day is not successful. So uh, at least, eh, at least one person to have fun with and at least one person to offend. Because practice is very serious, but at the same time you need to kind of push the boundaries <coughs> of seriousness that also clients, but also the, the financial world puts upon you. It also, you need to kind of absorb it and also kind of push it out in a different way. Without fun, that is totally impossible. Well, on your second score of offending at least one person a day, I knock it out of the park <laughs> on most day then using that score. Um, now, uh, That's a good thing <laughs> for a journalist. Many journalists don't do that anymore. <laughs> I want to just spool back to the beginning of, um, of your talk and, and, and talk about the Hong Kong project, uh, which mm. you missed out on. You just made an oblique reference right at the end there um, about uh, what you learnt from it. I just wonder if you can expand on that, what, what, you, what you did learn and, uh, and what you think the lesson was, was out of that. Because clearly you and the practice put your heart and soul into a, into a massive venture. Yeah. I was devastated after we heard we didn't win because we were called the day before by the chief executive to congratulate us. Uh, we were, so we were very happy and kind of we knew we won the jury, we knew we won the public and then kind of we were sitting there in Lechko and they were doing all their political blah blah, uh, which I cannot f understand because it's in Cantonese. So I thought now is the announcement and then they announced it and then Foster had one, which obviously for us was a very weird thing. So what did I learn from it? Uh, take nothing for granted. Um, work hard, uh, but make sure you're also a good loser, because at that time you can of course not cry. I can tell you afterwards <laughs> I cried <laughs> like hell. And um, what was very interesting about that process is that kind of what you see is that it is very difficult to communicate thinking uh, that goes beyond what people know. And, and that is where I was extremely naive. I, I came to Hong Kong in 2009. I thought, okay, this, this city asked these type of questions so they're ready for something new. But actually they were not. They were just asking uh, somebody important to recognize their question mm -hmm. and to not question that question. That is not how I'm brought up. That's not how the Dutch society works. Uh, so we obviously immediately started questioning. Now I think twice how I sell my questioning. So sometimes I pretend to not question while well, I do. And then I, I was simply too, too young to understand that type of politics. And now I think our practice learned a lot by it. And, and we, do, we do a lot of this similar type of work and now really execute it. Mm. Now, actually, I'm very happy I'm not involved anymore because the project is kind of two years delayed. The program is now only 50%, so even less than what we predicted. And the museum has secured one third of Uli Zieg's collection, the one third he had in storage because he didn't like it anymore. So th there is kind of a real problem with the project, so I'm happy I don't need to run it. And you're just a little bit happy that that's going on, aren't you? Uh, of course, I, I laugh about <laughs> it. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, but that's fun again. You can <laughs> laugh a bit. Come on. Of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, in Taipei, with um, the Shilin project, yeah. you talked about the open competition and mm. how um, you guys don't go for those because you can't be yourself, you said. What do you mean by that? Ah, because you, you, you're expected to do a dance and, and, and show four panels and show uh, 300 words of text and then you need to explain the project. It's impossible. It's impossible to because these competitions are run in such a rigid way to give everybody the possibility to express themselves uh, within the same framework so that it can be judged, you cannot anymore show any thinking or research. Kind of doing a competition is only useful when you, you give the person that participates the possibility to come up with the deliverables he wants. If you don't give him that opportunity and you restrict him, you know, then, then for us it's totally uninteresting un because I, of course I can make four panels and 300 words, but I cannot in that limited amount of space explain what I would want to give to a city or what, what I learned from a context because a lot of architects just simply show an image. But where does that image come from? What is behind the image? What is the program? What is the debate you want to steer? What is the context you're doing it in? 
it's impossible in these type of competitions to show that. So we don't normally participate. But the contradiction at the heart of that, of course, is that you, you, you won that competition and you've come up with a, an extraordinarily mm. unique and original building and one that clearly you believe is, is the, the true embodiment of the practice and of mm -hmm. the spirit. So how, how do we resolve that in the context of this no, competition? Yeah, because from the day one that we read the competition brief, we knew that we wanted to keep that night market and that that was something we wanted to say. And that was Even going to be your Even when we through. would lose... I wanted to kind of simply say that. Yeah. And the irony is that the first sketch we made is simply this building. Rem and I went there on, on site visit and we had only a magazine of an airline with us, which obviously we came by air. <laughs> and uh, he draws in a red pen, I draw in a brown pen so that you can see who does what. <laughs> And he drew a cube, I drew two uh, hanging things, and he drew a ball. And it's literally like that. It was just, that was really the project that we had. And that is what we portrayed and we sold it. And it's really selling it in a way. Mm -hmm. And now that picture was recently sold for a lot of money, by the way, by Christy. <laughs> <laughs> in a nice frame. Seriously? It was Seriously. Actually, yeah, what did serious. it sell for? Who bought it? Uh, somebody in London bought it. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we were, you were talking there uh, at the end, uh, inspired, of course, by that the great um, Venice Biennale project about, I guess, the, the vernacular of, of place and of local architecture and of historical tropes and, and types and the like. And then, of course, the all-pervasive nature of, you know, the, the modernist building. How, do, how does one incorporate that? How, how does one have a, a tip a hat to it, but also um, in a living sense incorporate that into a building without it being kitsch, without it being an add-on, without it not being completely thought through? By, by really understanding it. And I think that's where it all starts in architecture these days. We don't understand anymore what our profession is. We don't understand anymore where we build. Uh, we take everything for granted because a uh, plane ride is, is very close, so kind of you envision that it is similar to what you have in your mind or your perceptions are. Nobody does, and also we are very often by clients not permitted anymore in financial means or in, in other means to do proper research and to do proper understanding. Mm. And our practice just simply refuses uh, to, to work in that way. So we do that research ourselves. We are constantly busy uh, even when I don't have a project and I want to understand a piece of the earth, I will do research and I will just make a book out of it. And when I have that book, I can obviously also talk to clients in a different way. Yeah, uh, kind of Australia, we went in Darling Harbour. It was a success because the master plan won. But for us, it wasn't a success because we didn't understand yet how Australia works, what the procurement methods in this country are, how they treat architects, etc., etc. And after that, we did very proper research. We hired Paul Jones, who is sitting here on the second row. And, and we started really learning what this country does and how. And with that research, we're now approaching the market again. And we get a total different response, because now we know how to deal with it. Yeah. And I think that is something uh, architects simply forget. They, clients bring them in, uh, roll them in, give them all the agars give them a very little fee because there's also somebody else next to it that is rolled in with all the agars and somebody else, and they get a little fee and they need to compete. They are colleagues, they cannot have a debate, but they need to compete, and in the end they select one and you never know how. Is that really the way ar the best architecture is made? I question that, I don't know. Do we have any questions from the floor? Okay, it, it's, a, it's a question at the end, really. I'm, I'm thinking about the the buildings, I mean, I'm the artistic director of the South Bank Centre in London, mm. and that is a collection of buildings that were built from 51 and then added into in 67. And the, the, the whole site has the capacity to be like a kind of incredible port city with many, many things happening at micro level and at ma massive level, etc. Mm. To curate that rhythm, you have to enjoy the idea of culture happening in lots of different kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And it's not a practice that is taught at the moment. So the artistic director who inherits the buildings that you've got in Taipei, they have to really want to know how to create the rhythm from morning, noon, and night that will allow the night market, the viewers, the and even in art practice, because art practice tends to um, favor the purist. 
but a building like that is asking for something that loves eclecticism. So I'm just interested to know how you work with cultural practitioners, how we all collectively actually work as cultural practitioners, to find a language where the form of architecture can be met boldly with the content of work. Because at the moment, I don't think that dialogue happens. Okay, thank you. By, by, by simply making them part of our team and uh, to show them kind of our research, show them what we want to innovate, ask them if that's a good idea to do that or not. Uh, also to really work with the people to understand what their fascinations currently are and what kind of place they are creating, what they are making, what they actually need to have that creativity unleashed. And, and that is kind of a rare situation because very often you're, the government is your client or you have a private client. And then after the development is wrapped up, it's handed over to somebody that's going to operate it. Uh, but especially in Taipei and kind of even in the competition stage, Stan Lai, U Theater, all the, the people that do experimental stuff were already part of it. We had, we went to the theater in the Grand Theater in Taipei one night and people in smokings are sitting next to people in jeans, uh, which is really exciting to see because it's such a vibrant environment. Everybody goes to theater, everything is sold out. And, and they just have their, one has their night off, the other one has their night sleep in, in a theater. And it's super interesting to see that. So we just collected a group of these people and we took them on board in our team. Yeah, to also understand what is it, what, you, what drives you to come here? How can we understand it? So it's, it's really working with them and investing in them, but also getting uh, through that new ideas that you as architect alone cannot work with. Any other questions? No, none, really? I cannot imagine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, we have one just here. I was just wondering um, what role your think tank AMO plays in your projects that you've shown or not shown and um, how interrelated they are between practice and think tank. It, it's, it's one and the same group of people. Um, we only invented AMO because we're doing all that research all the time and we were never paid for it. And obviously you also need to sustain as a business. So, and it's a very pragmatic, pragmatic answer, but we were doing it. It is in our blood, it's our habit. And we thought it was important that the world knew about it and didn't take it for granted. And so I'm one day have my AMO hat on, the other hand an OMA hat, and we're constantly switching and changing. Obviously, we have other people in the office than architects alone. Yeah? We, we have all kinds of different professions in the office that help us think. They all have a fascination for the built environment. And these people may be not drawing an AutoCAD drawing of a building the next day, but they definitely also hop constantly. So it's, it's simply one organism that goes in every direction we think it needs to go in. And sometimes we call it OMA and sometimes we call it AMO. Uh, uh, which, which creates also an aura in itself. Uh, but it is one and the same group of people, uh, and that means also every architect that works for us needs to have many other fascinations than just architecture. You are talking before about needing to know how a, a place, a country worked, um, how the architects were respected, how procurement worked. When you're working on projects, say, staying, for example, um, with the Shilin markets there at Taipei, how do you organise your workforce there? How do you source them? How do you make sure they're all working um, in the way that you want them to and keep that consistency of approach? By first finding good people that are broadly interested and not per se have a portfolio that is the most, my most grand portfolio. That's very often I don't even look at portfolios, but I look at kind of the dialogue I have with people and also my staff that hires the junior staff, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they're really interested in the dialogue. That's the most important thing. How do they present themselves? How critical are they also to you? And then uh, the good thing is that because OMA is quite well known, we don't have a problem of people wanting to work for us. So we, we get an, in Hong Kong, we get about 360 applications every single month. 
uh, only Hong Kong, uh, so that I could revamp my office three times each month <laughs> if I want to. But, uh, it's a nice thing to hold over your staff. No, but, <laughs> but, no, but it's also good for them that it is above their heads <laughs> because that at least stays them, at least keeps them creative. But at the same time, it's also for me. Eh? If, mm. if I kind of start sleeping, I will also be exit soon. But you know, the, the interesting part is that, that you always find people you are fascinated in when they respond to you. And that is what you see in our workforce. It's not per se people that are trained in this or trained in that. It's really kind of about presentation, communication skills. And then we break them down on day one. We build them up in the coming <laughs> three months and then they are OMA people. It's not so difficult. <laughs> OMA, conquering the world one person at a time. Will you please thank David G. and Nutton this evening? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>